open up the doors again Let the King of glory in His kingdom will never end Oh, I know that you are good Break the darkness with your light All the earth can praise a lie any dead place come alive Oh, I know that you are good Oh, I know that you are good You will have my hallelujah You alone my highest praise All to Every breath I take, make my life your praise. Yeah. Spirit of the living God, fire burning in my heart. I'm wide awake to who you are. Oh, I know that you are good. Oh, I know that you are good. You will have my hallelujah. You alone, the highest name. All to you. I Every breath I take, make my life your praise. You are my strength when I am weak. You are my sight when I can't see. As praise goes up, I believe the walls are coming down. Oh, when I was lost, you rescued. When I was found, you set me free. As praise goes up, I believe the walls are coming down. Oh, when I was strength, and I am weak, you are my sight. When I can't see, as praise goes up, I believe the walls are coming down. Oh, lost you rescued me when i was found you set me free when our praise goes up i believe the walls are coming down oh you will have my hallelujah you alone Oh, 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 oh,
your name in all the earth. Oh, 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 oh our Lord. Your name in all the earth. We behold the falling rain. We behold the falling rain. Like waters rise, flood this place. We reach for you. We claim to you, oh Lord. Sing it again. We behold the falling rain. Like waters rise, flood this place. We reach for you. We claim to you, oh Lord. Ho, ho, ho. your name in all the earth. Oh, 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 our Lord. Oh, 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 our Lord. How majestic is your name in all the I want to see you. See us. 
sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Praise, praise, I lift my voice and raise, praise, I sing of your amazing. First things first, I want to let you know that we have some donations in the back. I'm going to go ahead and lay them out. They are women's clothing, and they're for, from size, I think, from 4 to 10. So if that's you, I will lay those out there. If there's something you want me to say for you, let me know. So I love starting out like that and just being able to bless that way. I obviously didn't bring the clothing, but uh, a gal in our fellowship did. So we want you to make sure that you know that that's there for you. Um, for those of you that are looking to get plugged in, I just want to remind you once again, we have our midweek studies starting back up. Of course, we'll always have this here on Tuesdays until we get into the holidays, but our men and women's Bible study starts up next week. The women are studying Job, and you'll see it up there. I should, no, nope, maybe we don't. It's the book of Job, and it's with Lisa Harper. There it is, right here. So I have one right here. I have them in the back. The cost for the sessions and the book itself uh, total is a cost of $20. So we're meeting on Thursdays at 630, my home, same, same place, same routine. So if you are interested in a book, please see me afterwards, and I'll make sure I get you one. And then for those of you going to the men's study, they'll start next week as well at 7 o'clock. It will be at Mario's home. There are maps that are provided for you in the back uh, on the foyer table. And so if you uh, know that that's something that you're interested in, please not only sign up and let the guys know you're coming, but go ahead and grab a map so that you'll know how to get there. It's got all the information on how to get through the gate and the code and all that. So that's in the back, and you will be studying Elijah and Elisha, the life of Elijah and Elisha. Pastor Howard will be doing a short study on that for both of these studies. They will be for seven sessions, so we'll end in the beginning of November, so before the holidays start in, and um, that's what's available for you on Thursday nights. For those of you doing our financial peace seminar, we are starting this Sunday, so you already have your kits. Sheila, Mike, you guys have your kits. Those of you that still need that kit, it's in the back. They're $99. Um, I'd be happy to get that to you. We start on Sunday at 4 o'clock, and this one's nine weeks. So we're going to go into somewhat of November, and then we'll go ahead and we'll cut right before Thanksgiving break. So I know it's a commitment for all of these three groups, but it's just a great way to not only get intimate, but to connect with one another and uh, to stay focused and pointed in the right direction, whether it, it has to do with life, marriage, finances, whatever. That's what we're here for and to do it together. So we're really excited about that. Um, the other thing I want to announce for those of you, just in case Jeff and Christine are watching live, do you guys know who Jeff and Christine Wilson are? Do you you guys remember Mr. Wilson? Well, they got married. I don't know if it's going to, if we ever found a picture, but they got married on Sunday on the beach and they left for Hawaii. So what I wanted to do was mention it because we had seen, I've known Christine since we were both single and before we hit 20, I think. And so to be reunited after all these years and to see what the Lord has done, not only in, in my life, but in hers as well. And then to see Jeff, when he first started coming in, we met him at Casa or Green Oak. Vista, uh, our church in Vista, and so <laughs> I want to make sure I don't uh, give you false information, but when we first met Jeff, he would wear those glasses that had the shades in, that had the lines, you know, the swirling lines, and then the little peephole that you could see through, and he would wear Doc Martens up to his knees, and I mean, it was just the guy, he was like, he's the guy I went to school with, and when we first met him, I just, I clicked with him right away, so did Pastor Howard, and we just got to know each other, and as he got clean and his life together and all of that, it's just amazing the things that he has accomplished in life, 
and um, because he's not here, I can brag about it. The, the guy's got ma his master's, he's got bachelor's, master's, all this stuff, and the guy is brilliant and just working and taking care of Christine, and we actually just saw it all come together and how all these years, the struggles and just the, the stuff that's gone on and the losses in their homes, it's just so amazing to see something really sweet come out of it. So I can't wait for them to come back so you can see them face to face and, and actually uh, witness uh, just God's glory and God's pleasure upon them because she couldn't stop smiling from ear to ear and they've known each other for many years. So it was just great to see them come to a place of actually the final step in their relationship to start a whole new season. So I'm really excited for them. So I wanted to announce that. The other thing I want to announce is that we have uh, Natasha who, um, Natalia, could you tell I knew it wasn't your name? <laughs> I've known Natalia for a long time too. Uh, Yes, so you know what, we just want to invite her up. Um, one of the things that we did is we prayed for her because she got the news that she had cancer and they did a little bit of a procedure. And so now what I'm going to have her do is actually uh, fill you in a little bit. It's only going to take a few minutes. Come on in. Everyone, welcome Natalia. Just a second. I wasn't prepared for this, but the Lord just telling me to come up here. And I remember just coming up here, I didn't even know I was um, going to come up on stage and Howard praying over me, and I remember the words saying, God is going to hear so many names of Natalia that he is going to heal you. He is going to be so sick of hearing my name, and I just want to let you know he healed me. So I, um, yeah, <laughs> praise God. And through this season, it was very, very scary, and um, my family came together, and I had one just accept, my daughter Brianna just accept the Lord last week. I got to pray the <laughs> sinner's prayer with her. And um, my other daughter, Destiny, has been praying with me that hasn't prayed in I don't even know how long. So I know that God is working through, um, through this and the hope. And I just want to say, like, God brought me to a a better place. He, I thought I knew who he was and the faith that I had was great, but I felt like I walked into a glimpse of heaven um, because he was so with me in everything that I was going through um, that now I feel like it's, it's so different. Um, I'm joyful and the little things don't bother me anymore. So thank you so much um, for the thousands of people who have prayed because um, God is faithful. Thank you, guys. I love you. All right. Oh, so, you know, I just love to hear how God works these things out and that they're, the reason we go through these things, that there is a reason and there's purpose in it. So praise God for that. I'm so excited. Um, now, also, I've got your name right, correct, Mark? One name right tonight. <laughs> Mark is celebrating 17 years sobriety. So you know the drill. You've been here long enough. You know what you need to do next, correct? You need to stand up. <laughs> and you know what? Now that Mark's standing up, what? Just stand up. That's Mark getting you back. Go ahead. Stand on up, you guys. Okay, is there anyone else that we could celebrate? We sang it, Michael, yes. 50 years old. Praise God for that one, huh? Anyone else? Ashley. Congratulations. Anything else? I didn't know if you had another announcement. I wanted to make sure. All right. Seven years clean. Congratulations. Anyone else? All right. Wait. Uh -oh. oh. We're not moving on. Bill? What do we, what's going on? We never, you know what? I just have to tell you. These guys have gone. Bill, why don't you stand up? And Diane, are you able to stand up there? Why don't you stand on up? Only because what you need to know is that Diane came to church for the first time in a long time on Sunday. I hadn't seen her since before summer. Is that correct? You actually stopped yeah. by my home. Yeah. And um, not only did Bill have some heart issues and surgery and a lot of things like that, near-death stuff, but so did Diane, and she survived an aneurysm. 
And so they, she's clear, she's healed from that, and now just kind of getting back to her old self and moving around. So we're just grateful. So, yes, we are going to sing happy birthday to both of you. Praise God that you're here for sure. Yeah, and we wanted to let you all know that Diane was actually the MMA champion for her weight class and her age group here in Southern California. So we're very proud of that, that fact. So let's sing it. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Jesus loves you. Happy birthday to you. Awesome. God bless you guys. All right, kiddos, let's go ahead and head to class. God bless you guys. So I'm going to play you a song. I love when we get together because we're filled with hope. Do you know what today is? It's 9-11, uh, isn't it? It's the anniversary of uh, the terrorist act that brought down um, the World Trade Center. And we remember them. And we remember the families that are still hurting to this day. It was 17 years ago. Uh, some of us in the room remember what we were doing 17 years ago when we heard. And so before we go any further, I want to uh, first uh, pray, and then I will play. So let's pray. Father, we, uh, we lift up those servicemen and women, uh, and the people stateside as well as overseas that are uh, fighting right now to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And Lord, should any, uh, as Isaiah said, no weapon formed against us could prosper, I pray that any weapon that's being formed, even now, I pray that it won't prosper and that it will be discovered and uh, murderers will be brought to justice. And, uh, Lord, that we would continue to be a nation under God and that we would continue to support uh, the, just the furtherance of the truth and, and of hope to a world that desperately, so desperately needs it. And I know that, Lord, you've raised us up for this, for this purpose and for this time. And so, God, I pray. I pray you'd bless our, our offering. I pray that you'd bless our time together tonight. And that in all things that you would be glorified. Lord, we remember the families that are hurting uh, tonight. That are experiencing the loss of a loved one. God, we pray. Would you comfort them? And would they, in the process, draw near to you in Jesus' name. And everybody say it.
For the ones who can't break the addictions and chains You try to give up, but you come back again Just remember that you're not alone in your shame and your suffering There is hope for the helpless, rest for the weary And love for the broken heart there is grace and forgiveness, mercy and healing. He'll meet you wherever you are. Cry out to Jesus. When you're lonely and it feels like the whole world's falling on you, you just reach out. Just cry out to Jesus, cry to Jesus, to the widow who suffers being alone, wiping the tears from her eyes, for the children around the world without a home, say a prayer tonight. There is hope for the helpless, rest for the weary, and love for the broken heart. There is grace and forgiveness, mercy and healing. He meets you wherever you are. There is hope for the helpless, and rest for the weary, and love for the broken heart. And forgiveness, mercy, and healing. He'll meet you wherever you are. Cry out to Jesus. Cry out to Jesus. Cry out to Jesus. never forget the night I cried out. You know what my prayer was? It wasn't like, you know, Lord, forgive me. <laughs> I mean, some people pray that one. It wasn't that. Uh, and the night that I encountered the Holy Spirit, it was like a building, like a snowball effect. It was like an avalanche in my life. And it started at night, uh, probably about three o'clock in the morning. I hadn't eaten in uh, probably a week and a half and I was completely emaciated, weighed about 150 pounds and um, I remember laying in bed and I, I prayed this prayer, I'll never forget it. I, I, I looked up at the ceiling and I said, God, you know what, if you're really, really real, could you show me? I mean, I was just honest. I mean, I, I was just being honest. I said, God, if you're really, really real, could you could you just show me? Could you show me who you are? And show enough. Sometimes they say, you know, be careful what you pray for because it'll come true. And I got to tell you, it came true for me, really, in a big way. And I know for some of you all, uh, you feel exactly the same way. If you don't have a Bible, please pick up your hand and one of these guys are going to hook you up. That's right. And then once you get it, I want you to turn to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. James is one of my favorite books in all of the Bible. Uh, totally enjoy that one. Minister to me. Meditate on it. Spend time in it. James chapter 5.
just going to read a few verses here. In James chapter 5, picking it up in verse 16, says this, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save us all from death and cover a multitude of sin. Now, I begin this evening with a question. Can you keep a secret? I'm just, I mean, there's a few of you that are wrestling with that. But, but right now, can we just, tonight, can, can we just share a secret together? Can we? I'm sorry, could, could we share a little secret together? Okay. Um, now, don't tell anybody this, all right? I'm gonna make sure, because I'm, I'm, we're sharing a secret, and you're, do you promise not to tell anybody? Just go ahead and promise. You promise not to tell anybody. Okay, okay, here's the deal. I don't know if you know this, but there are some really weird people here tonight. I don't know if you know that. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just, yeah, just look around. Just look around. Look around the room. Go ahead. Look around the room. Uh, some of these people have some serious issues, okay? Uh, not me. <laughs> you know, uh, well, maybe. But, you know, some of these people have some serious issues. And, and what do you do with that? What can you do with that? I want to give you an encouragement before I take one step further, and that's this. You cannot fix... That which is not broken. I'm going to say it again. You cannot fix that which is not broken, and you cannot improve upon perfection. Now, that's an encouragement for you. Because A, if you're not broken, there is absolutely nothing that we can do for you here this evening. And then, which comes to B, if you're perfect and you're here, could you please stand? Because we want to congratulate you on your perfection. Anybody? Oh, almost. Mom did. Almost in the back. Let's hear it. Yeah. Uh, notice what it said. Confess your trespasses to one another. That's for the rest of us. Confess your trespasses to one another. It, it means to be free and open about what is wrong. It's a public acknowledgement of that which is wrong with us. That's James 5, 16. It's an un unusual word he uses, confess your trespasses. The word's harmatia. And it means, it, it means to fail, to fall beside, to fall near, to elapse or deviation from the truth, to public publicly acknowledge to one another the fact that you've fallen or moved from truth to error, ain't, you ain't right, or maybe you've just simply sinned. Then you're supposed to, look at 16 again, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. It's Eomai is the word, and it's in the middle voice, and it means this, that you might be made whole or complete. Lacking nothing. Verse 16, again, let's read it. Let's read it aloud and together. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now that's an amazing truth, is it not? Sometimes wholeness, now I want you to get this in your brain because this is so important for you and I. And I think it could mean the difference between relapse and continuing on. Many times, oftentimes, most times, there's a huge connection between wholeness and forgiveness. There's a huge connection between the two. That's why making amends is so powerful for so many people. 
wholeness and forgiveness oftentimes, more often than not, are inextricably connected to each other. Psalm 66, 18, the psalmist writes this, For if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear my prayer, or he will not hear. See, the access to the healing that one has to face, it, they have to deal with the weakness first. So if you're taking note, I want you to remember this. Write it down. Admit the guilt. Admit the guilt. Uh, more often than not, I think I've been trained by life to not confess my guilt or admit my guilt. I justify my guilt or I explain my guilt. I qualify the guilt. Do we have any qualifiers in the room this evening? Yeah, we always, when we get faced with the guilt, we qualify it. Romans 10, 10, uh, the writer of Romans writes this, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. So sometimes confessing everything that you not will lead you to everything that you have yet to discover what you could be. I mean, this is a powerful thing. You cannot fix that which is not broken. Can I get an amen? amen. See, the Lord is ready to heal broken people, but he cannot heal those who are not broken. Are you hearing me? And get this, the Lord, it's like my prayer so many years ago. God is ready to heal even if you don't even realize how broken you are. Like you might understand that you're a broken or you're a little broken, but I, you know, I thank God that God only showed me in the initial stages of me walking with him a little bit of my brokenness. I think if he had shown me all of my brokenness, I would have went right back out again, just, just defeated by how broken I was. But he, he guides us through inch by inch through this process. Proverbs 28, 13. He who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them, and notice, I love this, whoever confesses and forsakes them, multitude, will have mercy. Proverbs 28, 13 from the message. This is even great, better. You can't whitewash your sins and get by with it. You find mercy by admitting and leaving them. So what is the three words that I ask you to write down? Admit the guilt. Admit the guilt. That's so powerful. If you do that, um, uh, put it this way. Pro, uh, Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So in other words, in the moment that I admit it, I am free from it. I'm free from it. One problem. Uh, I can admit my guilt. I can be freed from my guilt. But it, I'm not free from the feeling of guilty. Is anybody else with me? Yeah, you can say, you know, I messed up, and I'm sorry, I blew it, but I don't feel like those things are gone. You hearing, you hearing me? You, you, you following with that? See, there are a ton of people out here who have confessed to God the very nature of their wrongs, and still they feel guilty. Are you, are you in that pack? Are you one of those guys that, that or gals that have confessed that they're wrong, they're here, but they're still walking around feeling a little guilt? Ask me why. why? Ask me again, please. Why? Yell it out. Come on. Why? Thank you for asking. Because, because those people who are constantly batting with guilt, although they've confessed it to God, they still feel guilty, and there's one reason they need to confess it to somebody. You need to confess it. Yes, I talked to so many people that said, you know, I went to this meeting, and the, the guy, they played a song, and he asked them, come forward, and you can be forgiven, and you walk forward, and you're forgiven, and, and everything's fine, but today I'm still, that was last week, and today I'm still feeling the guilt. I Put it this way. If you want to be forgiven confess to God but if you want to feel forgiven confess to somebody I know you're looking at me kind of weird because maybe you never heard that before and next thing you're going to ask Howard what are you doing going Catholic on us or what's your deal no I, I I think there's one thing though that the Catholics have 
up on a lot of Christians. A lot of Christians, you know, Protestants, believe that they, they confess and, and then they're good. So what they do is uh, there used to be a song that Steve Taylor wrote so many years ago. He said, you get your slate clean so that you can dirty it again. And so Protestants are great at, you know, raising a hand and praying the prayer and confessing it to God, but never really being free of all that toxic behavior and all of the guilt. And the reason why oftentimes is because we don't confess to somebody else. We need to confess to somebody else. Somebody save. This, uh, by the way, this need for confession is a nuance that has been installed by the programmer. It's a nuance that has been created by the creator. It's been put in you, and it's been put in me. It doesn't need to be everybody, but it definitely has got to be somebody. When, uh, and I want you to, re this is kind of a Howardism, but when you reveal what you feel, you begin to heal, okay? When you reveal what you feel, you will begin to heal. Uh, uh, amazing process that's happened. I'm, I'm, I'm married, as you guys know, and uh, like today, there was, there was a look on my wife's face. It was a look that I knew that she was feeling something, feeling something that needed to come out. And so I kind of stood there and I waited because oftentimes you don't, when somebody's feeling something, you don't want to like charge in like I do. You don't want to be a bull about it. You kind of want to back up and say, so what's the deal? What's happening? And it was amazing that out of that came a bunch of things that she was dealing with in regards to our relationship. And she was able to communicate it without A, me interrupting, or B, me trying to justify or validate why what she feels doesn't matter, right? You ever been in a relationship like that with somebody who, when you tell them how you feel, then they respond with, well, you're an idiot, you don't understand anything anyway. So uh, basically, it's, it, when you're able to communicate what you feel, you begin to heal. Have you ever noticed how uh, people who get caught uh, feel release once they've been caught? You ever notice that? Or maybe you've been that guy or that gal. You know, you're, you're flying under the radar doing a bunch of stuff you know that you're not supposed to be doing, involved in a relationship that you know you're not supposed to be involved in, or, you know, involved in an activity that you know you're not supposed to be in. And then once you get busted, once you get called out, there's like this wave of release that flows over you. Have you ever, have you ever experienced that? I, I certainly have multitudes of times in my life. I want to remind you that this is nothing strange in the Bible. This, is a, this has always been a principle that's always worked. Think of this. Do you remember the story of King David and Bathsheba? You remember that story? Girlfriend was up on the roof taking a bath because that's what they did. And, and homeboy was up on his, uh, his mansion overlooking the people. And he was definitely looking in the area of Bathsheba. And it was kind of an ugly thing. One thing got to another, and before you know it, whoop, whoop, uh, they're in the king's chambers, and then bada bing, bada boom, she's got a little kingly bun in the oven, and her husband is not the dad, and it just, there's this whole clandestine thing that's going on in the kingdom. Everybody knows there's something wrong with David, and there's something wrong with Bathsheba, and there's a problem. I honestly believe that in David's kingdom at that time, everybody knew. Everybody knew that there was something wrong. And this is what happened. Nathan comes to him as a prophet. He's praying for David, and the prophet gives him uh, what God gave him. And, and he says, uh, basically, you're busted. Now, this was his comment on that lapse of time between when he got found out and when he was hiding, right in between there. So here it is. This comes from Psalm 32, verses 3 through 5. Listen to this. When I kept silent, my bones grew old, through my groaning all day long. 
For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer, Selah, which means think about it or meditate or marinate. I acknowledge my sin to you, verse 5, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Marinate, Selah. Now, the message just drills it right into each and every one of us. This is how uh, Eugene Phillips translated it. When I kept it all inside, my bones turned to powder. My words became day-long groans. The pressure never let up. All the juices of my life dried up. Then I let it all out. I said, I'll make a clean breast of my failures to God. Suddenly the pressure was gone. My guilt dissolved. My sin disappeared. I mean, is that awesome? I mean, this is the king. It didn't matter. What was he going to get? The death penalty? No. But still, there was that agony and that guilt that just drove his life right into the ground. Look again, verse 16. Confess your trespasses. And did you see the next three words? To one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. Realize that healing is available always, always, always. And I haven't said it, but I'm saying it now. Always healing is available in a community like this. Right, Natalia? Uh, Healing is always available in a community like this. So, okay, number one. The three words are admit the guilt. The next three words we have are bring a friend. Okay? Bring a friend. Tell a friend. Confess it. Now, I know some of you are going to push back and go, bring a friend? Seriously? Do I have to do that? I mean, this is personal. It's kind of a private matter. We don't want to talk. I I cannot tell you how many people have come to our group at different times throughout the 20 years we've been dealing with this and dealing with people and dealing with addiction issues. I can't tell you how many people have come from other fellowships, from other churches, and they've said, hi, Pastor Howard. A friend of mine said you were doing this, and I wanted to come. Now, can I talk to you? Yeah, you can talk to me. But can it be private? Because, see, I'm an elder at the other church I'm at, and if they knew what I was dealing with and what was going on in my life, oh, they would have me, they would have me just sitting in the pew. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be serving like I like to serve. And I thought, oh, what a shame. His reputation is more valuable than his freedom. Oh, isn't that, isn't that, isn't that just, just terrible when you think about it? So when you think about it being humility, uh, humiliating, I want you to remember that it's absolutely, completely, and totally necessary. Forgiveness comes from God. Healing happens in relationships. I'm going to say that again. Forgiveness ultimately and always comes from God. You can walk out and you can ask God to forgive you and he will forgive you. But the healing that you need that precipitated the guilt in the first place has not yet been dealt with. And that happens publicly. See, the biggest problem that you and I have, and just tell me if I'm lying, I'm dying, but the greatest problem that you and I struggle with is the problem of relationships. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Anybody struggle in relationships in the room? Could we just have a show of hands of all the people who struggle in relationships? Even Lucia put her hand up. I'm just saying it. I'm just saying it. Girl, she will not, you know, I just outed her in front of everybody. Go ahead, put your hand up high. Yeah, you, you struggle with relationships too. And the reason why we have a unanimous decision here tonight is because we all, we all lie to each other. We do. We have a way of performing. We wear the right mask. We say the right words. We fake it. We fake it. We pretend with each other. We just are a bunch of great actors. We can do it, and we always do it. See, we want, we want people To believe that we have it all together. I can't can't tell you how many churches I've known through the years that propagate 
this myth in people's minds, especially the leaders in the churches. They want you to believe the holy man myth. What's the holy man myth? The holy man myth is this. If you walk like I walk, if you follow my example, you'll be as cool as I am. As a matter of fact, you think God loves you now? Oh, you don't have any idea of how much he could love you. All you have to do is be like me, the holy man. Join me in that high place. I have an ivory tower. And we go up and we pray. We seek God. You know what's amazing? In my family, my wife adores me. And my kids actually think that I can walk on water. <laughs> Welcome to refuge. Meanwhile, the truth is, wife hates his guts. Kids can't stand them, and all of them resent serving God in the first place simply because it's a myth. It's not real. It's not true. I, I have been, and I've said this before, but I have been taken out to lunch by people from my church. One guy in particular took me out to lunch and said, Pastor Howard, you're far too honest about what's wrong with your life. You need to stop that because people, they, they, need to, they need to see you in a certain light. And I thought, there is a sad state of affairs. I think if anything, if you can know my flaws and my frailties, maybe you can find some hope for yourself too. You know what I mean? The power of what I'm sharing with you right now is this. The truth is most people know we don't have it together. Truth. Truth is people know we don't have it together. Do you know how they know? Because they don't have it together either. And they see the exact same weaknesses and flaws and frailties in you that they see in them. And as a matter of fact, I don't know if you're like me, but when I see somebody that is weak and as flawed as I am, it really ticks me off. <laughs> I, I want to school them. As a matter of fact, I want to school them hard because I think if I can beat on them, maybe I'll feel better about me. Isn't that amazing what we do? See, the truth is we're all broken, every one of us. There are two types of people in this world. People who are wicked and broken and know it. And then you have people who are wicked and broken and they refuse to admit it. I mean, that's the sad reality, isn't it? That, you know what they call that? In psychological terms, we call it denial. Yeah, denial. Denial demands compliance. Denial means that you have to keep the lie. You have to live with the lie. As a matter of fact, denial requires another thing that you and I, we're all too familiar with and we've had enough of it. But denial demands isolation. Denial means that people can only get so close to you. Can't let them in too close because then they'll figure out exactly how you really are and how messed up you really are. So denial demands isolation. Next thing, denial inspires, invites, and propagates fear. You live in fear when you live in denial. Fear owns you. In 1 John 4, 8, that apostle wrote these words. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out all fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. How do you learn that love? How do you experience that love? I'll tell you how I experience that love. Through you and through you as you accept me for who I am as I embrace you for who you are. All of you, warts and all. The worst that you can be. 
I embrace you. And get this, I discover love in the process and maybe I'll come out with it and tell you what's really wrong with me. And the beauty is freedom. I'll tell you this, if you have no intimacy, you will never have any security. And you can't just have one. You gotta, you gotta have a bunch of people in your life that know you, that love you, that appreciate you. If you don't have the intimacy, you cannot have security. And God has pre-programmed us for community. And you've got to get into community. Community is essential. One of the saddest things that ever happened when we moved this group, we, uh, we didn't move it by choice, we moved it by necessity. Um, because somebody said move. <laughs> but uh, one of the greatest problems that we had with moving was that we had all of these rooms that we could break out in and people got to know each other and really experience community. So would, I, I'm just gonna confess something for you guys tonight. Would you pray that God provides something like that again for us. Would you join me in prayer with that? Let's pray real quick. Father, we're asking you to open the door that we might experience community in a greater way here at Refuge. God, that we might see the world change through the intimacy we share with each other and the intimacy that we share with you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. See, when you find that person that you can trust, that won't judge you or think less of you, if, when you find that one person who's in the same boat that you're in, all of a sudden you start to discover something that maybe you're not as crazy as you thought, and guess what? You're not alone either. And there's always help available for you. The mind blower of all mind blowers, verse 16 again. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. This is amazing to me because what it means is that it's active, it's filled with energy, that it accomplishes that which, which it's set out to do. So in other words, as I confess to you and you confess to me and we pray for one another, it works. I mean, it works. It's an active energy. Look at verse 16. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. Are you seeing that? Do you know that that means faultless, guiltless? Do you know that that means innocent? That the minute that you step into that role as a confessor and a confessee, all of a sudden you begin to function in the manner to which you were designed. Oh, this is so powerful. This is what brings us freedom. It's the confession of it. You're upright, righteous, virtuous, innocent, faultless, guiltless. The admission of the position, verse 16 again, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It means to have enough power, to have enough strength, to be able. If there is sickness, if there is a weakness, if there is a moral failure, if you'll just publicly acknowledge in detail what it is and what it is wrong with, it without qualification and pray for healing and or forgiveness the lord will count you as whole upright righteous virtuous innocent faultless guiltless somebody say amen, amen. verse 17 and this is the one verse that inspired me to do this year's men's study by the way our men's study guys no homework no homework this guys love no homework uh next thing guys there's always something to eat. Guys love to eat, you know, and so we don't have any homework and we, we eat and we open up the Bible and we, we, we go through this. But this was the verse that inspired that. So you men, you need to confess, you need to continue to grow and to, to, to launch into a whole new level of existence. Come out. Anyway, let's go on. Verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Now that just floors me. I, I read that years ago. The first time I really read it and looked at it, I was absolutely floored. I mean, I was blown away because Elijah is the Babe Ruth of prophets. Elijah is the, uh, uh, not Tiger Woods because he's not doing so well, but uh, <laughs> let's just say he's really good at what he does. Yeah, there you go. But get this. He felt what you felt. He feels what you feel. He went through what you went through. 
In 1 Kings 19, in the wilderness, under a broom tree, he cries out to God, God, kill me now. That's in, that's in 1 Kings 19. In 1 Kings 18, before that, look at verse 17 again. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. 1 Kings 18, he's standing on the top of the mount. He calls down fire. I mean, 450 prophets of Baal. He's all on his own. He is yoked up in the spirit. He's ready to just rock everybody's world, and he does. But by chapter 19, one chapter later, he's like, God, kill me now. I don't even want to live. And, and he, look at it, verse 18. And he prayed again, the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. God heard, and, it, and, and God did the work. It wasn't the power of, of Elijah. It wasn't because he was good enough, smart enough, strong enough, any of that. Elijah was like us. It, was, it, was, it wasn't Elijah. It was God. Remember that. You have it within your reach, the sum total of all power and wisdom and knowledge and strength in the collective universe. It doesn't matter who you are. Just a man, just a woman, just a child. It doesn't matter. The only thing that could ever stand in the way is not confessing, is not asking. That's the only thing that ever gets in the way of your healing and your growth and my healing and my growth. Mark 6, verses 5 and 6. Jesus goes to Nazareth and he could do no mighty work there simply because they refused to believe. They refused to trust. God could do anything. God can do anything. In Luke 1.37, the angel Gabriel says to Mary, for with God, nothing will be impossible. Get it? With God, anything is possible. Get it? With God, anything is possible. You understand it? With God, anything is possible. And I, you know what? I'm, ha I'm happy, holy howie, and I want to be a possibility person. I mean, I want to be all about a possibilities, impossibility. I have been faced, and so have you. You have been faced with impossible situations, have you not? You have been faced with situations where you've been hemmed in. You didn't know that there was any way out. Oh, life was over. And then all of a sudden, what happened? A miracle happened, and there you were. And this is what happens when we become possibility people. You know what happens with possibility people? They're dangerous. Possibilities people are dangerous because they believe enough to not even care about their reputation. They just trust God and go on with it. I, I, I have been encountered, I'll never forget, I went to you know, Eastern Europe way years ago. And um, we were in Hungary, and there were, in, in Hungary they had just gotten rid of, uh, of uh, communism. And to throw off the shackles of communism, people were dressing like real provocatively. In other words, uh, the girls didn't wear any tops and they just wore, you know, bottoms and the guys, you know, wore Speedos, which is like in a Californian's mind, it's revolting. But uh, so, you know, there were, everybody was rolling around half naked and we rolled into this town where they were having a youth rally and it was all the people from 18 to 25 we're at this youth rally. So you have all of these semi-naked people and some naked people running around this town like college, you know, uh, gone wild. And, um, you know, everybody was, you know, because we're Americans and we're a bit puritanical, we were all just vexed by all of this. It was like, you know, I'm trying to share the love of Jesus with people and I'm look, looking at their eyes, you know. <laughs> I, just, I just dare not, you know. Can you imagine how hard it is to talk about the love of Jesus when there's an 18-year-old girl there with nothing on but a fanny pack. You know, it, it, it just, you know, it just, there's something wrong with that moment, you know. And I'll never forget, I was with this guy who's a pastor now up north. His name's Bill. And Bill said to me, Howard, um, and he began to confess all of this stuff, you know. He said, just getting caught up in lust and, you know, I'm just tormented by this. And, and you know, I, I, I got to tell you about it. And I was like, I, you know, at first I was kind of shocked, you know, like, Dude, you shouldn't be telling me this stuff. And, and then as he began to talk, I, I, I started to embrace the fact, you know, it, it, me too. And, and we just, 
wow, that's right, me too. When we got back from that trip, I mean, we landed in L.A. and there were people with clothes on. And I just went, thank you, Jesus. There, there we are, you know. The, you know I didn't care if they were in halter tops and short shorts. I was, they have something on, you know, thank God. But, uh, you know, when, when we prayed, it was the weirdest thing. When we prayed and we confessed with each other and we got real with each other, there was a breakthrough moment. It was like I was over it. I was over it at that point. I wasn't drawn in or anything. I was over it. It was just, just a moment where it, it, was, it was so liberating. And, and because I was free and forgiven, I was in a position to be used by God, just like Elijah, simply because I was free and forgiven. See, it doesn't matter what you're up against. We're just supposed to be a walking demonstration of the of the grace and the power of God. That's what we're called to be. God can do great things through us because we're free to navigate life realistically and honestly. So that brings me to my third thing. The first one was ad admit the guilt. The second thing was bring a friend. <laughs> and the third thing is trust the Lord. Just trust the Lord. Look at verse 19. This is why, brethren, if, there, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, stop there. If someone has wandered off, you know, as well as I do, this is a matter of life and death. If somebody has wandered off, they're teetering on the edge of destruction. I mean, when somebody's on the edge of destruction and wandered off, you don't walk up to them and go, hey, idiot, get it together. What's wrong with you? You're blowing it. I mean, you know, that's kind of overstating the obvious, you know? I mean, I've, I've had a few friends in the last year that have totally wandered off. And, and, and I'll never forget one in particular. I, I wasn't going to call because I was just too upset. I wasn't going to call. And Lucia, she, God bless her, that woman is filled with the Spirit. She looked at me and she goes, listen, don't you think he feels a bit alone out there? Don't you think you should, don't you think you could just pick up the phone and give him a call? And I was, I was all like totally just, ah, you know, <laughs> yeah, you're right. So immediately, I, you know, I pick up the phone. Hey, how's it going? See, only thing I wanted to do is give him what I already have. I just want to give him what I have. I just want them to have what I have. I, I just want them to be free. And I remember that God can do anything with anybody. When you're not consumed with you and what you're trying to hide, or you and what you want to try to cover up what you're trying to hide, or you who are trying to get what you do not have, and you realize how important you become because people everywhere are on the edge, aren't they? I mean, people are on the edge everywhere. Everywhere you look. And they need, and look at verse 19 again, and someone turns him back. We usually have no idea that we are the ones that need to say, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. And I want you to know I miss you. Or hey, how's it going? And that's okay. It's okay if it's not good. But I want you to know that, that I'm here and, and that God loves you and, and God can do anything. And here's the value. And this is where we go home. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way, I'll stop there. Just stop there. I mean... You know, I told you before we started the meeting, I, I didn't ask for forgiveness when I first encountered God. You, you remember what I said. I said, God, would you, and I, with tears in my eyes, I, I, I remembered, God, would you just show me the way? And that's when the next day, this kid came up to my house, a, a kid I'd been giving guitar lessons to. He was, he was no more than 16 years old at the time. And, and, and I had just prayed that prayer, and nobody was there, and he knocked on my door, and I let him in. 
and he was pacing back and forth. There was no way he could have known that I had just prayed that prayer the night before. And he began to share with me truth. Not only truth about life, but truth about my life. And he just, he just like opened me up and brought all of this stuff out. And he said, Howard, Jesus loves you, man. What are you doing? And, and I'll never forget, I, I, couldn't get him out of my, I couldn't get him out of my apartment quick enough. I just couldn't get him out of there. I just, I just needed to get him out. Like, thanks a lot, bro. You know, glad. You know, glad you shared. You know, this is a, it's a good thing. You know, can you, can I pray for you? He says, yeah. Oh yeah, go ahead, pray. You know, you know, I, you know I get my, I get my, my prayer face on. I'm gonna, you know, you know, you're gonna pray. And as soon as, and, I, and as, as he's praying, I mean, he's, he's calling down God, and he's praying. I'm just thinking, God, just make him stop. Just, just. <laughs> Just make him stop so he can go away. But the thing that happened was that, that it, it was God speaking. It wasn't him. And, 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 and when God talks, he's, he's got like a rewind button. And he, and he hits that button, then he hits play. And then he hits that button, then he hits play. And he hits that button, and he hits play again. And it just kept playing over and over and over in my mind. And it turned out to be the seminal, the greatest moment, the greatest single moment of my life. Because I was hearing from the creator of the universe through one person who was just crazy enough to be free. He never knew. He died. He never knew the impact that it had on my life. But God, God knew. Verse 20. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. I, do you realize what he's saying? He's saying, be open and honest with the multitude of sins that you carry around. Just be honest. Just start telling on yourself. Just rat yourself out. Just be a rotten rat. Be your own rat. You know, s just spill the beans on you. Just be absolutely disgusting about how disgusting you really are. And when you do that, what he's simply saying is this, is in the process of it all, as you bring it all out, who covers the multitude of sins? Jesus does. See, when I bring it out, he can pick it up. But if I don't bring it out, he won't pick it up. See, he's a gentleman. He stands at the door and knocks, but he holds his hand out. And he says, will you? Will you come unto me? Will you do this? If you do this, if you'll do this, I will bring you freedom. I just want to, I just want to trade all of your junk for my gold, for my glory. But only he can do that. But see, he does it when we confess it. So that brings us to our last moment here. I know you got issues. Some of y'all, it's just written all over your face. Others of you are more clandestine. You dress it up real nice. You make your sickness look good. Unfortunately, it may look good, but it smells bad. <laughs> and how do we deal with that? Well, we deal with it together tonight, don't we? We say, yeah, you know what, Pastor Howard? I am not right. <laughs> I have some serious problems, and I want to begin the process of entering into freedom. How do we do that? Well, I'm going to give you an easy one. It's step one. Admit the guilt. Bring a friend. Well, guess what? You're among friends. Hi, I'm Howard, and I'm your friend. And know that God can do anything if you'll just trust so let's do a trust exercise. Those of you that are dealing with some junk in your life, would you just stand up right where you are? This is confession 101. Yeah. You don't have to call it out. You know, hi, I'm a pervert over here. <laughs> 
hi, I've got, a, I've got an eating disorder, or hi, I'm on drugs, or whatever. It doesn't necessarily have to be that, but it can be this. Isn't this a great beginning for us this week? Is this not a good beginning? And I, I think you, you, you may notice that I'm standing with you. I'm with you. I'm not here for you. <laughs> I'm here with you. Jesus is here for you. And we are here hoping in him. Let's pray. Father, all of us stand tonight. And, and I know that a book could be written if all of us got together and confessed. If, if we began to identify everything that was going on clandestined behind the scenes in our lives tonight, we would probably be here until Saturday evening, about 11 o'clock. And we wouldn't have any breaks in between. And, and God, you know, the truth of it is, you knew that. You know it all. You see it all. As a matter of fact, you see it all and you love us anyway, which just defies logic. But I thank you for that. And you said if we would confess our trespasses to one another and pray for one another, that we would be healed. So Lord, right now we pray for the person on our left. Lord, we pray for the person on our left. We ask you, Lord, to heal them and to touch them and to make them whole. And Lord, make them virtuous and upright and, and change them. Father, I pray for the person on the right. God, they need you. They're standing. That's, that's confession enough for you, isn't it? it you, this is acknowledgement of you. I pray for that person on the right, and I pray, God, that you would fix it. God, that you would fix what is wrong, and you would make it right. I pray for all of the people around me. I pray, God, that we wouldn't be afraid to be real, to be honest, that we wouldn't hang on to a myth, but would hold on to you, our master. And in the process, we'd be free as you lead us into freedom. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this letter from your half-brother. God, thank you. We bless you tonight. We thank you for forgiveness in Jesus' name. And everybody say, Amen. I love you guys. I'll see you Sunday or I'll see you next week. Woo-hoo.